Well, Donald Trump is not Vladimir Putin's only friend in America right now. As a noted conspiracy theorist and vocal critic of U.S. support to Ukraine, Tucker Carlson is already well known as a bit of a Kremlin mouthpiece. So in his two-hour interview with Vladimir Putin in Moscow this week, it's no surprise he mostly just sat there as Putin effectively steamrolled him with revisionist history and disinformation. Now, Tucker can take some modicum of credit for asking Putin to release Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gerskovich, who's an actual reporter who's been wrongfully detained in Russia on false charges of espionage. But for the most part, this wasn't an interview at all. It was a platform. And by giving Putin that platform without pushing back on many of the most outrageous claims, Tucker handed Putin a big PR victory. Notably, Tucker did not challenge Putin's baseless accusation that the United States orchestrated a coup in Ukraine in 2014. He was also silent when Putin made the obviously false historical claim that Poland, not Nazi Germany, was responsible for starting World War II. At the same time, Tucker never called Putin's unprovoked attack on Ukraine an invasion. He never asked about Russian atrocities or the targeting of civilian infrastructure. He never asked about Putin's political crackdowns or Russia's rigged elections or his assault on democratic institutions around the world. In fact, Tucker later said he thought Putin, a war criminal, was sincere in justifying his claims of Ukrainian territory. The thing is, Tucker might be useful to Putin, but he's no idiot at all. I mean, deep down, he must know that his public admiration of a Russian autocrat is a bit disingenuous and opportunistic. That's because Tucker used to express a whole lot of skepticism when it came to Putin and Russia. And he did so when he was on this very network. I'll tell you this, as James Carville once said to me, and I thought it was a particularly insightful point, he said, I wouldn't get on a Russian elevator. <laughs> well, I get, if I can just end by saying, I think it's quite a stretch, though awfully generous of you, to add Russia and China to the list of so-called civilized nations. But you're a big-hearted guy. <laughs> the way the they Putin want doesn't it. have our interests at heart. Yeah, I mean, oh, I, 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 I cross the street to it, save our lives. It, what do you really know about Vladimir Putin? We dig up the dirt on the man running Russia these days. The struggle between the British and Russian governments over the poisoning death of a former Russian spy in London heats up. Why are the Russians refusing? to cooperate in the investigation? Do they have something to hide? Of course they do. Back then, Tucker also referred to Putin as a dictator and repeatedly slammed Russia for helping Iran's nuclear program. So while Tucker says he doesn't doubt Putin's sincerity, we certainly have reason to doubt his. Joining me now is someone who understands the stakes here better than almost anyone, Democratic Congressman Adam Schiff, Congressman, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. And I'm so grateful to have your expertise, given what I just started the show talking about. I, I guess we shouldn't be surprised. But when you were chair of the House Intel Committee, and, and since then, of course, you've spent a good amount of time looking at Donald Trump and Russia. How do you think Vladimir Putin heard remarks like the ones he made yesterday? Oh, Putin must be absolutely thrilled. Uh, if you look at it from Putin's perspective, you know, the war isn't going well in Ukraine for Russia. Uh, Russians keep coming back in body bags. NATO is enlarging around him with two new nations uh, joining NATO. NATO is strengthening. Uh, and along comes Donald Trump, uh, there to snatch uh, defeat from the jaws of victory uh, for Russia and, mm -hmm. and for the United States uh, and our NATO allies. Um, it, it couldn't come at a worse time. Uh, Trump's Republican Party is holding up aid for Ukraine uh, Trump is the gift that won't stop giving to Vladimir Putin. Uh, and, the, you know, he thinks, I'm sure, uh, Donald Trump thinks this makes him sound strong, but it just makes him look like an incredibly weak leader, uh, weak in not bolstering our alliances, weak in un undermining our security. Uh, we have benefited from that NATO alliance uh, as much, if not more, than any other nation. Uh, and for him to belittle it this way, for him to signal to our allies you can't rely on America anymore, uh, it just couldn't be more dangerous and destructive. It's such an important point, as you just noted. Simultaneously right now, they, there is no movement in moving forward funding to support Ukraine in the war against Russia. And it's also important. I mean, 2016 feels like a long time ago, but a lot of these things could repeat themselves. As you think about kind of this Trump-Putin relationship, if he gets a second term, what concerns you the most? What concerns me the most is that essentially he forsakes our allies, uh, that he real, realigns the United States with the dictators of the world. Uh, he makes common cause with fellow autocrats. Uh, he seems to admire dictators. He seems to have nothing but disdain for democracies. 
uh, that kind of realignment, that kind of tearing down of an international law-based order, which has protected the United States and done so much to uh, increase and improve our security, would be so destabilizing. Destabilizing to us uh, security-wise, destabilizing, destabilizing in terms of our economy, which would take a colossal hit. Um, but we would, we would give up our historic responsibility of defending democracy. Uh, and as we would see our own democracy at home uh, undermined, we would also see the cause of democracy around the globe suffer real body blow. Are you worried um, that Putin could be attempting and the Kremlin could be attempting to intervene in our election in 2024? And should we all be spending more time talking about that? I am very concerned about it. Uh, it wouldn't be the first time that Russia's intervened in our election. No. It wouldn't be the first time they've done it to try to help elect Donald Trump. Uh, and they have so much more at stake today than they did back in 2016. Uh, with the war going on in Ukraine, uh, with uh, NATO enlarging around it, uh, they feel beleaguered. Uh, and here comes Donald Trump, a real lifeline. They have more at stake. They have less reason to avoid risk. The United States is supporting uh, Ukraine in the war, or has been until Trump's influence on the GOP. So they have more at stake now than they did before. They have less risk aversion than they did before. Mm. So yes, we should fully expect them to engage. It's just a question of how much they engage. More at stake now, such an important thing for people to remember. As, as I noted earlier, there's a lot of legal news this week, and I want to get to that. I want to start with Robert Hur's report. First, what was your overall reaction to that report? Uh, you know, as a former federal prosecutor, my reaction was Robert Hur couldn't make a legal case against Joe Biden. So he decided to make a political case against Joe Biden. Uh, what he did was willful. <laughs> that is Robert Hur. <laughs> what he did was deliberate. What he did, he knew would damage uh, Joe Biden politically and gratify Donald Trump. It was a political decision that flies in the face of what Department of Justice policy is. Uh, and I can tell you this, if Robert Hur were a line prosecutor, he would mm. be disciplined or fired. Uh, you don't do that. You mm. set out, OK, you know, we could bring a case or we can't. But gratuitously involving yourself in an election campaign, uh, in fact, during a campaign, you make every effort not to do anything suggesting politics. Uh, what he did was was quite deliberate uh, and destructive and, and also just plain false. What, I mean, you're right. It's interesting to hear you say he would be fired if in a range of circumstances. Do you think that he should appear before Congress and ask and answer some questions? Would you like to see that happen? I think he will probably be invited by the Republicans because they can count on him to continue violating department policy and bashing mm -hmm. Joe Biden. Uh, I think they would view that as a great political gift. But this is so horribly inappropriate. Uh, he couldn't make a legal case, and so he's doing what he can to damage Joe Biden. Uh, you know, look, I sat in on a lot of depositions. I remember deposing Carl Rowe. I can't remember how many dozens and dozens and dozens of times that uh, Rowe said he couldn't recall. Uh, mm -hmm. And nobody, you know, questioned his cognitive ability. It was quite transparent uh, in the case of Carl Rowe, what he was doing. But uh, clients are told Hey, if you don't remember specifically the facts of things that happened years ago, which is not uncommon, you know, don't try to reinvent what took place. Uh, and there's nothing, I think, unusual about a deposition uh, in which people can't recall details of years ago. But to to extrapolate from that and make a political attack, uh, that that's just hackery by Mr. Herr. In fact, Ivanka Trump, I think, said that about 29 or 30 times I, I read this morning. Before I let you go quickly, I wanted to ask, I mean, there are certain limitations, of course, under the special counsel statute. But do you wish Attorney General Merrick Garland would have done something differently here? Could he have? Uh, he could have. He could have appointed someone else. He could have appointed uh, a different special counsel appointed by a different uh, the president of a different party. But, you know, Merrick Garland has really bent over backwards to do the right thing, to, you know, withdraw the department from the terrible uh, reputation it had under Trump of being politicized. Uh, and tragically, that requires you to uh, anticipate a certain amount of professionalism and faith in the system and faith in the people who are appointed. And, of course, that confidence, that expectation was completely betrayed here. Completely betrayed. Uh, and 
So, you know, in hindsight, it, it's too easy to say he mm -hmm. should have just appointed someone he knew would be more impartial. But, uh, you know, ideally, you appoint a prosecutor that will improve public confidence in the report. You don't expect them to be a hack. And in this case, uh, he misjudged Mr. Herm. Congressman Adam Schiff, I always appreciate your broad range of expertise. I really thank you for joining me this afternoon.